our work it followers and listeners, it's incredible how time flies and it's already December. The CNA podcast team takes a season break for this month, but we wanted to resurface a few of our top performing episodes, which you may have missed. We kick off with the number one on our list, both in terms of reach and engagement, mm-hmm. which is our chat with DBS CEO Piyush Gupta. I would say it was quite a highlight for us too, right, Adrian? We went to his office. He was charming, open, honest, quite easy to talk to. And he also forced us to get out of our comfort zone. It was really a wide-ranging discussion and he also spoke about his own journey as a banker, his guiding principles when it comes to handling crisis. And of course, you mustn't miss this, what he thinks of work-life balance. Yeah, that got quite a bit of heat. So have a listen if you missed it and share it with someone who hasn't listened to it too. Enjoy this episode. You're listening to a CNA podcast. Can you do this without reading? Both of you. Oh, without reading? Let's say a wind-down message. <laughs> Right. Like, you know what my, you want to say? My mic. Can, you want to say, can, can. You, you, can what are the course. two points you want to say, right? You say, <coughs> you know, this is... Um, Challenge if accepted. You, if you got anything from you, pass it on. And out of all box. you want to say <laughs> is, we're going to take a break and so on, right? Say it without reading. Can, can. everyone, welcome to this rather special episode of Work It. Normally our guests come into the CNA studio, but today we are on the 45th floor of the Marina Bay Financial Centre. And I have to tell you, the view is quite insane. Hi listeners, it's Adrian. Yep, this building is home to DBS Bank. And our guest today is the CEO himself, Mr. Piyush Gupta, who frankly needs no introduction. He takes the seat in our special series called The Leader's Chair. Even if we list his resume, I can tell you it'll be far too long. You only need to know two things. He's been with the DBS Group for 13 years now. That's correct. And he's been with Citigroup for 27 years. He and the bank have won a clutch of awards. Okay, lah, so that's more than two things. But Piyush was one of the world's top 100 best performing chief executives in the Harvard Business Review 2019 edition of the CEO 100. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on our podcast. Welcome, Piyush. Uh, thank you, Crispina. I would have been happy to come to your studio, but I have to confess the view from here is nicer than oh, the view. Way oh, way nicer. Absolutely. Trust me. <laughs> we always start with the question about journey. So mm-hmm. you are 63 now and uh, you've been banking for almost all your life. So looking back, was it something that it was by accident or was it something that when your parents tell you, oh, you know, you should try to consider becoming a banker and you said, yes, of course. Uh, I've said this before, Adrian. I've called myself an accidental banker. I had no plans to be a banker. Mm -hmm. My agenda was to become a diplomat. I wanted to join the foreign service, travel and see the world and be a diplomat. And the reason for that is that uh, like many other people who are in leadership positions, uh, Indian origin around the world, I was the child of a bureaucrat. Mm. And so many people who came from middle class families and bureaucratic backgrounds used to set their ambitions on continuing to join the bureaucracy. In my case, I wanted to join the foreign service. As things happened, to join the foreign service, you had to take an entrance exam and you needed to be a minimum age. Uh, Mm. 21 to take the exam when I cleared my undergrad I was only 20 so I had a year to kill right and I decided to go get an MBA so if I didn't qualify I'd have something to fall back on right and in the course of my MBA I realized that there were other vistas other things you could do and potentially still achieve my objective of seeing the world Mm. so to cut a long story short I was given an offer by Citibank And I thought, you know what, lets you travel overseas, it pays you well, Uh, why not try (laughs) this instead of, you know, going and being a diplomat. Now, I'll tell you the interesting part of the story. When I made the decision, my father actually flew down to where I was to try and persuade me not to take the decision. Oh, Oh, wow. He said, oh, you don't realize how good it is to be a bureaucrat, an administrative officer, you can Mm. make a big impact, etc., etc., Honestly, my response to him wasn't very thoughtful because I told him, you know, dad, forget everything. I will get paid more in my first salary than you make at the end of your career. So Aww. it's a very different life in the private sector. But you are right. It's true. I mean, I mean compensation yeah. matters. But in reality, I fell in love with the job. I realized within mm. three or four months mm. that the job was made for me. 
Oh, you know, that's banking, wonderful. a lot of people think it's a finance job. It's really not a finance job. Mm. Uh, banking is a general management job. And my skill set actually is very well aligned to what it takes to be a good banker. Right, because it's people facing, right? People facing. But more, you've got to bring together a sense of, you know, big picture thinking. Mm. So strategic uh, skills. Right. You've got to bring an analytical brain. You've got to be good with people and EQ. Yeah. You've got to be willing to be eclectic in your interests, which I've always been. Yeah. So I realized very quickly that this is a fantastic area and I could really make a difference in that area. Was there a pivotal moment in that three to four months mark that tell you this is really the right thing? Uh, it's ironic. We all got sent to the Philippines for our first trainings. And it was a four, six week program. And they brought in people from all around Asia. So from Japan, Australia, Singapore, etc. There are about 50 people in the class. And I topped that whole class. And after I topped the class, I figured maybe I'm good at this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if there was a sign, that's the sign, that's right? The sign. If, if ever yeah. there was a sign. Okay, let me get your take on banking and, and a bit more specifically to Singapore. I'm a DBS customer. Your customers are from like kids Everybody. all and the way to I have, to, I have to thank you for being a DBS customer <laughs> I myself have seen the kind of the change, right? I've not been into a physical bank, must be like a year now. I've read about your efforts to transform in terms of the tech, in terms of reskilling the people. That's change management. And we read about certain industries, that's not easy to do. If you could distill it, what did you learn from change oh that crispin you you thrown in about six questions in that one question <laughs> but let me uh, touch on some elements of where you were going first of all i think it's quite clear that the way we all live our lives has changed in the last decade it's not just banking sure the way you book your movie tickets the way you book your travel the way you make your selections and choices for consumer purchase the way you do your shopping everything has changed of course and so you've got to recognize that technology is changing the way consumers buy, consumers compare, and consumers live. Yeah. And therefore, if you're going to be successful as a company, as a provider of services, you have to cater to that change. Of course. So the first principle of any change is this. You've got to recognize that change is an imperative. Mm. People often call it the burning platform. So how do you create a burning platform? And to me, that's the first big learning. That if you don't have a burning platform and a compelling uh, story, a narrative of why change is critical, you will not get everybody okay. aligned to the change. Okay. The second element to the change is most things are not brand new, invented. You can learn from copying others. Okay. So I copy shamelessly. And so when we started <laughs> our journey, we went and studied all the big tech companies. Yeah, we figured and said, sense. you know, how yeah. does Amazon do it? And mm. how does Google do it? And how does Alibaba do it? Mm. And we learned a lot of things from them, which was very different from how a bank did it in the past. Sure. We learned that you could acquire customers completely digitally. We learned that you could eliminate paper and do everything at the touch of a button. Yep. We learned the power of data. We learned the power of partnerships and ecosystems. Mm. And so we figured and found a, a set of directions that okay. we could take. Right. But beyond that, I think there were two or three things which are critical to chain management. And I've, I've said this before. The first is, um, how do you get organizational alignment and commitment? So the, you guys know very clearly what you want to do. And the platform is burning. So you're clear. But how do you get all these people to follow you? So you've got to be a good storyteller and paint a narrative. Mm. And then you've got to be able to walk the talk. Okay. So my CIO, when we started, Dave Gladhill, he came up with this mnemonic of Gandalf. In oh. those days, everybody called the big tech companies the fangs, you right. know, Facebook, Amazon, yep. and so on. Yes. He one day had this brilliant uh, brainwave saying that you could actually rewrite that fangs and call it Google, Apple, Netflix, LinkedIn, Amazon, Facebook. And it's missing a D. And if you put a D, it becomes the <laughs> wizard from Lord of the Rings. So... <laughs> He came up with this program about right. DBS can be the D in Gandalf. Mm. Mm. Now, this was important because it changed our reference point. Mm. And so for all of our people, it made it clear that our reference point was no longer going to be the other bank companies. Yep. Our reference point was going to be how did technology companies operate. Mm. And this idea of being the D in Gandalf, it really got resonance in yes. the people. Mm. It gave people something to aspire to. Yeah, because they can see it. Yeah. Right? And so you know, people is started figuring, yeah, you know, we can do this. We can be it. And that is the second big part of chain management. Uh, received wisdom then and even now 
has always been that it's very hard for old companies to change. Yes. You know, it's very hard for old people to change. And it is something that I've never believed. I figured that you look at all the people in the 40s and 50s and 60s today, we're all changing in our personal life. I started the podcast by telling you that you're doing everything differently now. So when people can change in their personal lives, then why do we think they can't change in a company? Mm. And so I have this big belief that the problem is not with the human being. Okay. The problem is with the company. Mm. Mm. And so if you create the conditions in the company that allow people to experiment, to take some risk, to learn by doing, to uh, innovate, people will do it. Yeah. So we came up with this big mantra. We called it the 18,000 people startup. Mm. And our big vision was that we were not going to have two classes of citizens, one who were changing and one who were not. Mm. We said we're going to take everybody on the journey. But to do that, you have to teach people by doing, because adult learning is from doing. You got to uh, give them some uh, latitude to make mistakes. You got to go through the process of teaching people you know, how a big tech company operates. And so we went through a whole journey. We, we have to orchestrate a program of change. I'm a big believer in chain by design. So we orchestrated a whole program for chain we call Making Banking Joyful. Mm. And it was, it was a, I created a uh, central transformation team to help me drive that program. Right. So it was a very studied change process, not yeah. an accidental change yeah. process. It was actually planned, executed, thought through. And so that makes it more, a little bit more likely to be successful too. And right? democratic. That's the key thing. It was participative. It ah. was not... And frankly, to me, the biggest joy was when I started figuring that this had caught a fire at the roots of the organization. Mm. So instead of my telling people or the senior management telling people what needed to be done, we started hearing stories from the bottom of what people were trying to do. Oh. And, you know, it took us two, three hours. But when we got there, we knew we were on a roll. So then you so, knew you got the yeah, formula kind we of We got right. the formula, right. Okay. You mentioned about walking the talk so that you can impress upon everyone that change is uh, necessary and change is possible. Are there any intentional walking the talk that the management or the city management looked into to drive that across? Well, we did many things. We were the first in 2014. We started running hackathons. Now, hackathons were events where you'd have about 13 DBA staff and a couple of startup kids. You'd put them together and you'd have like 15 teams of the sort. Mm. And you'd give them a week-long problem to solve. And they had to learn how to storyboard. They had to learn how to do journey thinking. They had to, you know, try and figure out an app to solve the problem. And the two kids would help them code the app alongside but the DBS senior team would be part of these uh, processes. Mm. And on Friday, the DBS senior team would go and we'd evaluate how people had done, whether they'd learned the journey, what the outcomes were, we'd award and reward people. Now, that's a way of making the talk come alive. Right. Uh, you know, so you've got to be able to do things like that. Mm. And let's talk about challenges. Some people that I know of seems to have this romanticized impression of a CEO where things are nice and dandy, just give instruction for ivory tower. Mm -hmm. But we all also know there are a lot of challenges when CEO can come under fire. And no one faces the heat more than a bank, especially when things go south. So for DBS, I guess the most obvious one would be when there's a tech outage, when you no know, app is down, people cannot pay for stuff. I'm sure you've got teams and SOPs in place to deal with it. But for you personally, what is it like? Could you walk us through a day of those chaotic moments? There are two or three um, things which are worth touching on. First is this question of accountability. I've always believed that to be a leader, you've got to have a big belief in what President Truman used to have on his desk, the buck stops here. Mm. And so the sense of accountability, I think, is quite important. I tell young kids, when people are looking for what does it take to be a leader, I tell them individual accountability is the first thing I look for. So you've got to figure at the end of the day, the buck stops with you. Mm. And you're right. So that creates its own sets of pressures and challenges because it doesn't matter what the nature of the problem is. As the CEO of the company, I'm accountable. I personalize that. And whether the problem was with a third-party provider or the yeah. problem was with a errant employee or it was just an accident. Finally, as far as the consumer is concerned, the customer is concerned, I'm the CEO of the bank, so I've got to fix it. Mm. And uh, so that's the first facet. I, I do take personal accountability. The second facet is this. People do things differently. My management style is, people have called it the helicopter style. So I can be very big picture, but I also roll up my sleeves and get into the details. I get into the weeds. And therefore... You know, every year, I'll have eight or ten projects which I personally drive. So I roll up my sleeves and get deep down into those. A challenge of the sort you're mentioning would be one of those. It mm -hmm. was not a planned project, but if it's an important enough thing, 
then I will try to get under the hood to make sure I understand what the issue is. We properly are organized around it. We know mm-hmm. how to fix it, etc. But the third part of the challenge is, this is the hardest. How do you give people the sense of urgency? But at the same time, how do you give them air cover and confidence mm-hmm. to not lose hope? It's very easy to start beating up on people. Of course. And frankly, that's a, a lot of companies and environments have that culture. It's a blame culture. Yeah. Yeah. The minute you start beating up on people and create blame, then you start getting bad outcomes because it makes people fearful. Mm. And it makes people fearful they won't do what you want them to do in the future, which is use their brains, exercise judgment, and do things. And to do it authentically, right? Without you telling them. Correct. So you, you don't want to compromise on that. But at the same time, you also want to make sure that people understand that there's a sense of urgency, the problems need to get fixed, and if there were some root cause weaknesses, that those root cause weaknesses are addressed. So mm. so you have to make sure that other people other than you also feel accountable yeah. for stuff. And that's always the challenge. The balance between making sure there is accountability, but at the same time, you provide enough air cover to not uh, vitiate and dissipate confidence yeah. in the team. But it must be hard. I just want to pick up on the point where you say it's personal to you, right? I've heard this so many times. When something happens and then you get taken to task for it and then the person says... It's work, it's not personal. But I always feel like it's always personal because work is such an important part of your life. I would agree with that. I am a big believer in the fact that work-life balance is all baloney. <laughs> and the reason I think okay, it's baloney... Okay, quotable quote. There. Well, it's baloney <laughs> not because I want people to work all the time. It's of course, not like that. of course. I'm very eclectic yeah. and have a lot of time for things I do. It's just that I believe that work is a part of life. Yes. Mm. Right? So how do you divorce work from life? If all of us, we spend 8-10 hours working. Your mm. friends are there. Your colleagues are there. Your impact is there. Your growth is there. Your income is there. How do you divorce that from life? Exactly. And therefore, this notion that something is personal and something is not, is not easy. For me, I've always believed that you've got to be friends. You've got to be able to make sure people feel like they're part of a family. Mm. You've got to make sure the emotional environment is one of being together and being one. And if you can achieve that, you get really extraordinary work outcomes. Okay, expanding on this idea of setbacks, you've talked about this before. You tried to be an entrepreneur, didn't work out, and you've been open. You said that, oh my God, it took a terrible toll, you know, because you were worried about the 100 people that didn't have a job. What did that teach you about leadership? You know, interestingly, it changed my leadership style in two ways. The first thing, my appetite for risk changed. Mm. And that's a really important lesson. You know, what had happened, I'd, I used to be doing well at Citibank. I was the head of Citibank in Indonesia. Yeah. I'd given all that up. Mm. I'd taken my wife, my two young kids. We'd gone and moved back to India to set up this dot-com. And it didn't work. And by yeah. the way, at the same time, whatever savings I had melted because of the dot-com bust. Yes, right? so, the dot-com bubble, yeah. So the bubble had bust. And so whatever I thought I'd saved, I hadn't saved. Mm. Now, when you've seen the bottom of the barrel, which is what I thought I was seeing, it changes the outlook on how bad can it get. You've already Mm. seen the worst. (laughs) Then, you know, going forward, you know, it can only get better. And so it changes their appetite to take risks. You've already taken so much risk and you survived, in which case you can figure how you take some more risk. And by the way, that's really important because Mm. at the end of the day, the change is so rapid and change is accelerating. And so without making some bets, without taking some moonshots, without taking some risks, you're not going to succeed. Yeah. So that was my one big learning. It changed my attitude to risk. Mm. But perhaps the more important and pertinent thing that it changed was my intent. So I've said this before too. In my 20s and 30s, and after I figured I was good at banking, like many others, building my career was probably my single biggest driver. You know, so it was, how do I make sure yeah. that I can get ahead? I get promoted, I get a bigger job, mm. I become the youngest MD. It was all mm. driven around, you know, how do you build a career and get uh, to the top? Yep. When I went through this mental anguish um, after the dot-com fail, I spent a long time actually with a very different prism, trying to figure mm. out what makes me enjoy life. What do I enjoy doing? Right. And the reason I came back to banking was no longer because I thought I could build a career. I came back to banking because I figured this is a subject I know well. I enjoy it. I think I can make impact. Mm. And if I had to do this for the next 15 years of my life, it would be a fun thing to do. Yeah. So I came back with a very different mindset, a mindset of making impact 
rather and and relevance as opposed to career building yeah yeah there's this book called uh, skin in the game i'm not sure if you've heard of it the author argues that someone with skin in the game with basically entrepreneurs shape how people lead and how people are led so i think that kind of speaks to your experience as well the shade of a difference like spina i think when i talk about accountability in the beginning i've always had that mm. so even in earlier jobs you know i always felt i had skin in the game but the skin in the game was a different skin it was how do i get ahead if i right. do this well i'll get progress mm. the nature of the skin changed it was more if i can make a difference i can make impact if i can leave the job or the customer or the business better than what i inherited that's a good thing i feel like that comes with a bit more experience like young people they are just ambitious they want to get to the top and i think that's okay too because i don't agree with you if oh, you no. talk to any gen z today they don't want to get to the top they don't want to get to the top they all want to make impact <laughs> so they start okay. frankly Which they might change right? i'm not sure how, how long they'll stay when i was That's... growing up in the 1960s and 70s the hippie movement was very similar uh. <laughs> yeah, nobody wanted to get to the top yes. and they all wanted to make sure they made a difference which is very good but by the time you got to 1980 all those people had joined and got onto the treadmill <laughs> so the question is are these cycles and do people eventually get to a stage where you know who is it who said that when you're young if you're not a left winger you don't have a heart but oh. by the time you're in your 30s if you're not yeah. a capitalist you don't have a brain <laughs> <laughs> so having gone through that bottom of the barrel moment how do you think it shaped and transformed the way you approach leadership over in dbs bank versus how you approach things in city bank were there some very obvious contrast it actually wasn't that much that experience honestly mm -hmm. but my leadership style has evolved and it has been driven more from an appreciation of technology and an appreciation of what i talked about the millennials and gen z mm. and how they would like to work and be managed what's happened is that the old way of managing which is really top down and hierarchical style of management it has its roots in the early late 19th century when max weber created this concept of a bureaucracy when henry ford was creating the assembly line he was trying to create the right organization to match the assembly line yeah. and so that perpetuated for 100 years and it created the power of middle management because knowledge was a premium mm. people who knew what to do were important and then you told the people at the bottom of the pyramid this is what you need to do well what's happened with technology first is that no knowledge is no longer a premium you can google anything you want right and therefore as long as you can connect the dots you know you can google it you know exactly what anybody has does so <laughs> you got to recognize that there's been a shift yeah yeah human memory is not that important anymore because you can mm -hmm. go find out as long as you know what to look for okay the second change that's happened is what we were just talking about kispina the younger kids do want to make impact sooner mm. and i've seen that they can multitask I and mean, you talk to most of these kids they want to be ceo when they start but yeah. i sometimes joke but at the same time the truth is they do want to make impact they don't want to be small cogs in the wheel and that's a valuable thing that's you think that's a good thing yes, that's a good it's, thing it's, it's a good thing mm. it's a good thing you know if you go back to i mean again i love history you go back to 200 years ago when you were 13 and 14 you used to do full time jobs right yeah. this whole idea of teenage and adolescence was a creation of the 20th century before that it didn't exist <laughs> Now so you have the human capacity to start doing big things very young. Alexander was 33 years old when he conquered the world and died. Yes. Think about it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so he had died at 33 and we are now worried about people in their 30s doing things and not doing things. <laughs> so my style changed to see how do I actually involve younger people and therefore get to a more horizontal style of management, a more participative leadership style as opposed to a more directional and directive leadership style. And technology lets you do that. But I'm sure that takes a little bit of, I don't know, time, a little bit of experience. Not everybody can do that so easily because we were used to a different type of leadership. And then now when you are leaders, we expect it to manage Gen Z is a little bit differently. Uh, it, There's some yeah, adjustment, right? The on... adjustment, the adjustment all around, right? I think you can learn. Mm. and if you are conscious of thinking how do i get the best outcomes right and is there a different way to engage people and get the best outcomes you get there so i actually start often with thinking you know what would i create in the work environment what is the employee value proposition mm. which will keep these young people in their 20s and 30s interested in their job and loyal to the company yep and we start with that prism then you say you know i've got to create an environment where they can do the things they want to do they can mm. make impact that they have a voice 
and they're not just you know busy like robots yeah. you know yeah so the minute you say okay this is what i want to solve for then you have to change your leadership style speaking of gen z and millennials let's move on to talent is something that we talk about a lot on this podcast how to find good talent how to keep them and a lot has been written about how leaders have aspired to be all things to everyone but give us a hard truth since you've been there done that how do you look at good performance and also especially how do you deal with someone who isn't performing I have this rubric of the five eyes I call it sometimes I make it six eyes <laughs> and that's what I look for in people to figure that they have they have runway I encourage all people that this is what we should try to achieve so I talked about individual accountability already yep. the second thing I look for is initiative so are you willing to step up mm. and come up with your own ideas I often say it's very easy to go through life just turning on your pc in the morning and answering your inbox yep you'll have 100 emails hmm. so you can go through and by 8 o'clock you'll have 80 emails and your whole life is around answering what people tell you to do yep. the real trick is how do you create your own outbox if you are junior mm. i tell people at least 10 20% of your agenda should be your agenda mm. and by the time you get to my level 50% of the agenda should be your agenda not driven by somebody else mm. so that's initiative okay. you know how do you actually create your own outbox The third I for me is innovation and it's a buzzword but it is questioning the status quo it's not making the new iPhone but it is being willing to think about new ways of doing things a lot of the people who do well are constantly questioning why is this done this way yeah and you know is it people so policy but why is the policy there mm. or regulation but why is the regulation there there must be a root cause yeah and if you can keep questioning why do things happen the way they are and is there a better way to do this and achieve your outcomes you do well mm. because it creates a questioning mindset and that's the innovation the fourth i for me i call inspiration mm. and that's about taking people with you it's not just inspiring your juniors though it's also inspiring your peers is inspiring your seniors how do you get people to be aligned to your agenda and there are two sub themes to that one is empathy you got to really be willing to put yourself in other people's shoes mm. that's how you take people with them you got to empathize deeply and the other sub theme to that is communication skills oh, so yeah. if you want to inspire and take people with you you have to be able to write well and speak well i think that's probably the most underrated skill today <laughs> you know Amen. the capacity to communicate <laughs> yeah. and be able to take people with you yeah. and the fifth i is uh, i call it intent so your purpose of why you're doing what you're doing should be clear right and if you can make sure your agenda your purpose is aligned to the organizational purpose then mm. you're Perfect. on steroids it yeah. works works really really well So everybody has their own you know thing or looking for I look for these things in people and I encourage people to develop these skills and if you do that then by and large you do okay the struggle is when you meet someone you know who doesn't do okay well right? okay that was the second part of your question you know first of all I have a innate belief in people's capability to do something and it's not always the same thing you know scientists today tell you that there are actually nine types of intelligence yep and we have so far by and large focused on two of those which are verbal skills linguistic skills hmm. and analytic numeric skills yep the other seven types of intelligence includes environmental knowledge uh, musical skills spatial knowledge etc yep. etc et now i have always believed that there some people are better at other things for example my wife is just fantastic with environment she's not very good with numbers So you got to go and look deeply into every person and say what is this person really good at. Mm. And if you can do that then you can generally give people advice on what you think they could be better at than the right. job that they're doing. Right. right? Sometimes they figure it's within the job as well that you know you're doing this job which requires customer facing skills this is not your strength. Mm. You know we should put you in a different area where you can just do do number crunching you'd probably be better at that. Right. right. Uh, but other times I've had to tell people I don't think you're cut out to be a organization person. Right. I don't think you're cut out to be a banker and maybe you want to try one two three four other things. My experience has been as long as you have a genuine interest in helping people realize their potential you can actually give people some very difficult messages mm. but as long as you're authentic yes. and people understand that you're trying to tell them stuff which is probably good for them in the long right. term right now that we've got the heavy stuff out of the way let's do a few lighthearted questions okay so we have this round where we just ask our guests uh, some rapid fire questions yeah it's kind of like a rapid fire just whatever comes to your mind okay so i'll start tell us what golden rule do you have about managing your time Uh, split the urgent from the important. Wow, that's hard. 
No, it's not hard. We all of us have urgent things to do, hmm. and the urgent things need attention now. Hmm. But the urgent things are not always the important things, and so I keep my important things for when I can really apply mind to it. And hmm. most of most of my important work happens over the weekend or on planes. But ah. the urgent stuff happens morning to evening when you got to yes. respond and firefight. Okay, my turn. If you had one extra hour in a day, what would you spend it on? Reading. I love reading, and mm. I'm very eclectic. So I read fiction, non-fiction, etc. But I always am left with the stack of books, magazines, periodicals. <laughs> all I'm going to get to it someday. I, I just don't get to it. Okay. Complete the sentence. Behind every good CEO is a great spouse or partner. Absolutely. And finally, one piece of advice for a young person who is starting out in their career. Nobody knows the future. Mm. I mean, that's um, obviously a non sequitur. But I think the pace of change is dramatic, and therefore, earlier you could make or take a view on ten years. Now you can't even take a view on two years. So I think what will be useful to build careers actually is the capacity to connect the dots. Okay. And therefore, learning how to think, learning how to probe, learning how to work with people to empathize, these will be far more important than deep domain knowledge because mm. domains will keep changing. That's great. Okay, we have a few more bonus content. The book that you're reading now. It's called the Ministry for the Future. I think Obama had it on his one of his you know top Summer reads for reading, last year. Yeah, yeah. And I'm about a third of the way through the book. It's scary. It's about climate, climate change. Oh, it's about like climate change. Mm. Okay. And since this is a podcast, we have to ask you: Is there a podcast or your favorite podcast that you're listening to? Well, I'm listening to The Empire right now. It's fabulous. Really well done. Okay. Exercise that works for you. I do yoga, but that's uh, just to keep the body limber. It doesn't give you enough cardio. Mm. So I also go to the gym a couple of times a week. What is one thing that fatherhood has taught you? Patience. <laughs> the kids always know more than you do. You got to at least the thing they do. <laughs> okay. What would an ideal retirement look like? I uh, love nature, so I'm going to spend a lot more time with conservation and nature. Mm. I spend a lot of time with birds and bird watching, and uh, friends and family to create a lot more time for friends and family. Thanks to my uh, guest, Mr. Piyush Gupta. He is very eclectic indeed. I hope you enjoyed this conversation, and if you learned something from it, please pass it on to someone you think would enjoy it too. And if you want to give us feedback, we'd love to hear what you thought. Write to us at CNA Podcast at MediaCorp dot com dot sg. I think it's a good indication in this episode where there are so many common themes across all the different leaders that we have spoken with. Yep. And what I really found interesting in this episode is one of the key things that could be helpful for you is to come up with an acronym. So in Piyush case, in Vivian's case, eyes? is Gandalf, <laughs> where oh, a lot Gandalf. of the ring came into place. Okay. And I think the whole storytelling thing, this has been very little mentioned in many different aspects. How the stories can lead a movement and many other people together with you to go on to this journey. So I hope that is something that our listeners, who are leaders, can learn from. Our thanks to the DBS team who facilitated this, and to the CNA podcast and digital teams. Workit will be taking a season break for the next few weeks, and we'll be back in late July with a second set of leaders on our special series. So stay tuned.